Hello and welcome to Global Eye with me, Parikshit Lutra. It's been seven months since the Ukraine-Russia war began. So where do things really stand? Ukraine has recaptured territory which was under Russian control in both southern and eastern Ukraine. President Putin refuses to relent. He's stepping up the military offensive. In the meanwhile, President Biden has warned about the risk of a nuclear Armageddon for the first time since the Cold War. So where is Europe headed with this war? What does this mean for the energy security of countries which are dependent on Russian energy? We're joined by Germany's envoy to India, Philip Ackermann. Uh, Ambassador Ackermann, thank you very much for joining us here on Global Eye. Uh, give us a sense of uh, what does Germany feel about the trajectory of this war? Ukraine has recaptured some important territory in eastern and southern Ukraine, which is under Russian occupation. Uh, Russia has announced its intention to annex Ukrainian territory, step up military operations. Where is all of this going? So, um, Parikshi, thank you for having me. And I want to start by saying that we observe the situation on the ground very carefully. And as you rightly say, the development on the front is interesting to see how um, quickly the Ukrainian uh, troops have uh, being able to uh, to conquer parts of the territory back, and that was quite a remarkable achievement, I would say. At the same time, we see con continued attacks on Saporizhia, on the on the nuclear power plant and the surroundings, and therefore, I think um, one should not be too quick in um, in drawing conclusions. It is a very difficult situation, and this conflict is not uh, going to stop soon. It's it will be with us for a long time, I'm afraid. What is your view about the risk of a nuclear escalation? We've seen rocket attacks in Zaporizhia. Do, do you feel that a nuclear escalation is possible? I think um, there is a real threat. Um, I don't want to say that it is going to come. I think it's not uh, sure. And we have experienced Mr. Putin as a gambler in the, in the past couple of months. He is, um, uh, you know, you don't know what he has really in mind, but um, with the situation um, deteriorating for the Russian side at the front, I will not exclude that he uh, recurs to old um, old threats and he has uh, voiced and worded these threats a couple of times. So, uh, frankly, we are very worried right now. As Putin gets more desperate, do you see this war entering a more riskier situation? Yes, I think the risks are real. You have seen that the American side has reached out to the Russians and have made clear, the American side has made clear, what that would entail as a consequence from from the from 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 the Western side. So I hope that the, the Kremlin understood this message loud and clear that if they escalate, it comes at a tremendous cost also for them. So I still hope and pray that this is not going to happen. But I have to say, you know, after our experience of the last couple of months, we expect um, you know the worst basically. So uh, let's keep our fingers crossed that it's not going to happen. <laughs> According to you, how could this war change Europe's security architecture? This is a very interesting question, and I think that is um, the question, the main question that every European country is asking itself now. Now, I think um, what you have seen in Germany is a sea change, uh, as it were, um, when it comes to a reassessment of foreign policy. We have started rearming our own army by a large, uh, with a large amount of money. We feel that territorial defense is becoming much and much more important. We will try to uh, enable our army, but also other European armies, in order to defend European territories against aggression. And therefore, I think you'll see a more robust approach in Europe um, militarily um, when it, it comes to defending its borders than we had before. Frankly, we were under the illusion that war in Europe was not an option anymore. And basically, we were very surprised that this illusion was um, false, was a wrong illusion. So therefore, we have to rearrange uh, our thinking. We have to beef up our armies. And, and that's uh, done together with our European allies and friends. Also give us a sense of how Germany is looking to step up military support to Ukraine. So as my government has said, you know, um, um, we will support Ukraine as long as it is necessary. Um, Germany is one of the top three contributors to Ukraine. Um, uh, we have um, civilian and humanitarian aid delivered, but also we have a, a lot of weaponry and ammunition delivered, including, you know, vehicles, um, small tanks, howitzers and machine guns and so forth. So 
Um, our uh, commitment to Ukraine is, is very, very um, uh, steady and, and, and will continue as long as it is necessary. It will um, go hand in hand with the support of our allies, America, America plus the European allies, and we will uh, shape it. But you right. can count, <laughs> Ukraine can count on Germany um, in this, in this con in context. And asking you about a medium and long term view of how Germany is looking to secure its economic needs and energy needs as a result of this war. So, as they say in diplomacy, never waste a crisis. You know, um, you, you um, uh, must see um, uh, sources of energy um, that are now for us much more interesting. And I think mainly that would be re renewables. Um, um, we will heavily invest in renewable energy and storage of renewable energy. We will very, very um, uh, sort of uh, substantially invest in hydrogen, uh, in green hydrogen. So you'll see that there is a change, a transition in energy um, provision in Germany that um, will be accelerated by this war in Ukraine. And, you know, everybody in Germany is looking towards sources of energy that are non-fossil um, and have to be developed very quickly on the ground uh, with wind, solar, water, and hydrogen. So this will be, I think, a, a growing part of our energy mix in the very, very near future. And maybe this is basically one good thing out of this whole catastrophe that we are accelerating our um, transition to, to non-fossil uh, and renewable energy. All right, we've run our time, but Ambassador Philip Ackermann, thank you very much for joining us here on Global Eye to give us Germany's view on where this war is headed and uh, about the risk of a nuclear escalation as well. On that note, we take a short break here on Global Eye. When we return, we get you an exclusive conversation with Hans Timmer, the World Bank Chief Economist for South Asia, on the latest World Bank outlook for India and South Asia. Don't go anywhere. That exclusive conversation coming up. Singer. You love Mohammad Rafi songs. Think at the best. Yeah. Welcome back. You are watching Global Eye. Time now for a CNBC TV 18 exclusive. Lingering scars of COVID-19, a global slowdown, war in Ukraine, an economic crisis in Sri Lanka and floods in Pakistan are among the unprecedented combination of shocks for the South Asian economy. That's the word coming in from the World Bank in their latest outlook for South Asia. The World Bank has projected a 5.8% growth for South Asia in 22, a 1% downward revision over June and also slash India's GDP forecast to 6.5% due to global uncertainties. Speaking exclusively to CNBC TV 18, Hans Timmer, World Bank's uh, chief economist for South Asia, said that India is in a better place than other economies, but there are inflation challenges as well. I began by asking him about uh, the World Bank's growth projections for South Asia. The key challenges are that South Asia has been hit uh, in short order by uh, what we would call a series of once-in-a-lifetime uh, shocks. Uh, so we had the, the floods, devastating floods in, uh, in Pakistan. We have the impact of the war in, uh, in Ukraine, uh, rising, uh, pushing up the uh, commodity prices, food prices. We have a full-blown uh, balance of payments and macroeconomic crisis in, uh, in Sri Lanka. And that comes on top of uh, the once in a lifetime uh, pandemic, the COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And now more recently, there are headwinds uh, because of the slowing of uh, activity and import demand in high income countries and the tightening of monetary policy in high income countries that leads to a tightening of uh, 
of uh, global financial uh, markets. So many, many uh, challenges. Uh, as you said, we downgraded uh, our forecast for this year, GDP growth for the region now 5.8%, uh, 1% uh, uh, downgrade from only a few months ago, from June. Uh, and it is a slowdown uh, for the region as a whole because the previous year growth was 7.8% mm. when the region rebounded uh, from uh, the COVID uh, crisis. Uh, right. Two caveats uh, with that forecast. One, uh, the, the countries show a very diverse uh, development, mm. uh, still a shrinking economy in uh, in Sri Lanka, uh, although it's difficult to put numbers on it, uh, declining incomes in uh, Afghanistan, while in other countries, GDP growth is still uh, firmly positive. Mm. Uh, second caveat is that GDP growth doesn't tell the whole story of income development uh, for countries, uh, because there are income losses on top of GDP because of the rising import prices. And that means that households in the region, they don't experience the kind of income that uh, would be suggested by GDP growth forecast. All right. Difficult situation in South Asia. All right. A difficult situation in South Asia. How do you think India is likely to fare among other South Asian economies? Uh, India is still doing relatively well, although it was also downgraded uh, uh, one percentage point since uh, June, uh, with now the forecast of 6.5% GDP growth. Uh, again, a slowdown as we see in the in the rest of the the region. Uh, uh, India uh, has the same. Uh, the problem with the rising commodity prices, rising uh, input prices, and also the tightening of uh, the global financial markets and, uh, uh, and, and weaker demand abroad. As a result of that, we expect that the second half of this calendar year will be relatively weak also for uh, India. All right, you're saying that uh, H2 will be weak uh, for India as well. Now, when it comes to India's export story, uh, how do you think this is going to play out for the rest of the year? It's a, it's a mixed bag, uh, like other countries. Uh, the, the weak demand in the rest of the world doesn't help uh, India, and that puts uh, downward pressure on, on exports. Uh, at the same time, uh, over the the last two years uh, since uh, the start of, uh, of COVID-19, we see very strong exports in what we call the new services. Uh, the digital services in general uh, got a boost in, uh, uh, in all countries uh, during the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, but especially uh, India benefited a lot from that. And we have seen that uh, coming through in the exports of services uh, now also. Mm. So a, a difficult story on the good sides, but a very positive signs on the exports of of new services. All right. Uh, positive on the services. Uh, but uh, to speak to you about inflation, the large picture when it comes to uh, inflation is that the World Bank currently is projecting a 9.2% inflation for South Asia, which will start declining gradually. Why, when do you think this decline will happen? And uh, where does India stand when it comes to this inflation projection? Yeah, the inflation projection for India, I, I think, uh, uh, is uh, is above uh, seven percent. That's uh, above the uh, the range that uh, the central bank would uh, would want. So it's still uh, on the high end side. There are several uh, drivers of that inflation. First of all, of course, the uh, uh, the commodity prices uh, that went up. Okay. Secondly, uh, strong domestic demand in the rebound from uh, COVID, uh, driven also by a large fiscal uh, deficit, a rebound in, uh, in private consumption, and, and still some disruptions on the supply side. And, and so all these factors, they have led to, uh, uh, to, to inflation. Uh, when will inflation come down? Um, uh, so 
when uh, when the commodity prices in international markets come down, that helps, uh, of course. Uh, when uh, the demand uh, becomes more moderate, and that means also consolidation on the fiscal side in, in India, uh, that is important. Uh, a further uh, normalization of monetary policy uh, would contribute to the slowdown in uh, in inflation uh, and then also all the measures that can boost productivity increase supply and uh, and counteract the supply disruptions that came from uh, from the covid uh, pandemic all right uh, so there will be uh, conditions which will be needed to fulfill when it comes to uh, driving down the inflation uh, of course we will have to battle inflation in a big way but uh, going ahead what are some of the challenges that you foresee for the indian economy i, I think the current uh, uh, situation that we just discussed is one of the main uh, challenges and how to deal with inflation uh, how to uh, make sure that uh, you have the, the proper reaction uh, to inflation, uh, avoiding a wage uh, price uh, spirals, uh, making sure that the price signals uh, are still uh, working in the economy. Mm -hmm. And so that means uh, no price subsidies, uh, but uh, direct income subsidies. And uh, India has made great progress in expanding its social protection uh, system mm -hmm. since uh, COVID. Uh, 19, uh, making sure that uh, uh, you uh, you don't rely too much on export bans, mm. uh, as we have seen recently, because that can uh, backfire. Mm. So that's a big uh, challenge for uh, for India. Uh, making sure that uh, going forward you accumulate buffers uh, to uh, to absorb new shocks and the shocks will continue uh, to come. Mm. Uh, there are significant foreign exchange buffers in India and that's why India is doing relatively well at the moment. But it is important to build up also fiscal uh, uh, buffers, that is important. Mm. And, and as part of a longer run strategy, mm. it is uh, really important to broaden the uh, economic base uh, uh, in India. Uh, still only 20% of the women uh, participate in the labor market, 80-90% of the people in the informal sector with low productivity. So most of the growth is coming actually from a small part of society, mm. large formal firms. Mm. Uh, and, and to broaden uh, that uh, activity mm. uh, is incredibly important for long-term growth. Mm. They've also the People, the tools mm -hmm. themselves to uh, cope with uh, shocks uh, and ultimately also to increase the revenues for the government, which right. is important for, for sound medium term fiscal frameworks. Uh, Mr. Timmers, uh, you also said that uh, export bans are likely to backfire. India has put restrictions on the export of sugar, wheat, and rice. Uh, what kind of reaction do you foresee in the coming months? Yeah, it's difficult to project what will happen in the coming months. It's just a, a general observation from uh, past experience uh, where countries impose uh, export bans, uh, which uh, are, are very logical because food security of your population mm. is uh, really important. So it's a logical reaction. But what it does is that it further increases the prices in international markets. Mm. And that means that the gap between the price domestically and international markets mm. will uh, will widen. Mm. It's bad for other countries, but ultimately it could uh, backfire also domestically because mm. the producers of these commodities see the high prices in international markets mm. and it's likely that they start hoarding or or wait till they can uh, can export in in other markets uh, so in the short run uh, it's a logical reaction uh, in the medium run our experience is that it might backfire all right thank you very much hans timmer for joining us uh, with your outlook for the south asian economy that's all we have time for on Global Eye. Thank you for watching and goodbye.